In 1527, the Holy Roman Emperor and King of Spain sent a fleet of five ships and 600 men to explore Spain's new claims across the Atlantic Ocean. On the coast of Florida, these explorers were met by tales of treasure. These tales drew them deeper into the dark swamps and dense forests of the New World. But rather than gold, these adventurers found only poor health, hunger, and hostile natives. The men finally attempted to make an escape, only to be captured by cruel weather and rough seas. Their rafts were destroyed, many were drowned, and the remaining survivors were marooned on the island that would become known as Galveston. By the time the expedition reached the interior of what is now Texas, disease, desertion, and death had dwindled the original 600 men down to only four. Only Alvar Nunez Cabeza de Vaca two other Spaniards, and a black slave named Esteban remained. As they journeyed across Texas, the men were astounded to find cotton culture and cotton blankets superior even to those found in Europe. Ten years after he had left Spain, Cabeza de Vaca found his way back, and he told his tale, a tale that would be repeated and relived many times in the coming centuries. These men and their slave had escaped to Texas from the east, Following tales of fortune, they had found cotton. Cabeza de Vaca's wondrous tales of his trek through Spanish Mexico's wild northern territory drew more Spaniards to Texas. Over the next 200 years, explorers, soldiers, and missionaries crossed the Rio Bravo in search of treasures to be taken and souls to be saved. These early travelers laid the foundation for Texas by establishing a network of roads, the Camino Real, that connected their outposts, garrisons, and missions. The missions were intended to be self-sufficient villages where Native Americans would become loyal subjects of the Spanish king and devout members of the Catholic Church. Among the most successful outposts established by the Spanish were a series of five missions nestled near the headwaters of the San Antonio River. Along with their food crops, these missions grew and harvested cotton. This cotton was cleaned, spun into thread, and woven into cloth, all by hand. By 1745, the San Antonio missions were producing several thousand pounds of cotton each and every year. In the 250 years since Cabeza de Vaca's trek, the population of Spanish subjects in Texas was still fewer than 3,000 people. Spaniards living south of the Rio Grande clearly did not see opportunity in the hostile wilderness that was Texas. But the Spanish crown knew that her neighbors to the north and east would. When the growing United States purchased Louisiana from France in 1803, the U.S. became Texas's new neighbor, and Spain's need to protect the Texas border from illegal immigrants became an immediate concern. The missions were successful, but they didn't provide that single element that the king wanted most, and that is colonists for his far northern frontiers. Uh, he, he pleaded with his uh, subjects to move to the northern frontiers and could get no takers. It was seen as a dangerous place. So he hit upon the plan to open his northern frontiers to settlers from the United States. If they swore allegiance to him and to the church, he would provide them land at substantial discounts. Both would win. He would get his colonies and settlements. Uh, the settlers would get land for raising cotton. Among those who heard the king's call was a respected lead miner living in Missouri. Moses Austin had been known as King Lead. He had once had the largest lead mines in the United States, but Moses had fallen on hard times. He was bankrupt and running from his creditors. In 1820, 
Hearing the King of Spain's call, Moses saw an opportunity, an opportunity for a fresh start in the Texas wilderness. He traveled to San Antonio and with the help of friends, petitioned the Spanish government to allow him to establish a colony in Texas. Austin's request was denied until a friend, the Baron de Bastrop intervened. He got Moses an audience with the governor of Texas. The governor wanted to know how exactly Austin planned to fund a colony. Moses made his plan clear to the governor. They would grow cotton. Moses returned home to await the Spanish government's decision. During the trip back to Missouri, Moses was abandoned by his traveling companions and left without horses or supplies in the harsh Texas wilderness. By the time word arrived that his petition had been approved, Moses Austin had fallen gravely ill. Two days before he died, Moses summoned his wife, Mary. Mary Austin wrote in one of the most famous letters of Texas history, her husband's dying request of their son, Stephen Fuller Austin. He drew me down to him and with much distress and difficulty of speech, told me it was too late, that he was going. He begged me to tell you to take his place. Tell dear Stephen that it is his dying father's last request to prosecute the enterprise he had commenced. Stephen Fuller Austin honored his father's last request. Late in the summer of 1821, he left San Antonio and scouted the coastal plains of Texas for land suitable for his colony. Austin inspected land along the Guadalupe River, the Colorado River, and the Brazos River. The land he selected stretched south from the Camino Real to the coastal plains between La Baca and San Jacinto. The land along the river basins carved by the Brazos and Colorado rivers is among the most fertile in the entire state. The mild climate, abundant water, and rich soil were ideal for a new colony that was to be built on cotton. He began to spread the word of the opportunity for a fresh start in Texas. Newspapers throughout the United States ran copies of Austin's letters, describing the land and offering huge tracts at 12 and a half cents an acre, a tenth of what land costs in the neighboring southern states. But Austin's call was specific. He needed two things, farmers to grow the cotton and mechanics to solve an ancient problem 